Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from Dr. Lillis' lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's an author of several books, including Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, A Theological Contemplation on Prayer, and Fire from Above, Christian Contemplation and Mystical Wisdom. In this particular series of conversations, we'll focus on the spiritual writings of St. Teresa of Avila, and in particular, her autobiography. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Anthony. It's good to be with you, Chris. Thank you for these conversations we're having on the life of Teresa of Avila. I am so thankful that you're helping us in this journey, especially in areas of her life that, for Teresa, were times of, can I say, ambiguity. She's kind of not 100% certain of what is sin, what is not sin. She's trying to struggle with sufferings, different teachings from different teachers. She's not unlike a lot of us in those types of struggles. To situate this struggle that she's having, she's relatively new in, to religious life. We just saw in the previous chapter how the Lord was already granting her advanced favors and prayer. She was really just getting started as a young adult in, in her life of prayer, and she was already practicing or benefiting from the third spiritual alphabet, uh, Luis de Granada, his treatment on recollection. Well, y- usually you benefit from a description of prayer when you're you've tasted it somewhat and so she's she's able to gather the powers of her soul and bring them into silence before the lord and be attentive to his presence and this is a a great gift and she she also describes even if just for a short time the prayer of quiet which is the beginning of a mystical prayer in her life and that's where the lord communicates an even deeper silence into the soul a silence beyond the activity of the soul to be able to bring about a deep peace. In charismatic circles, they might talk about resting in the spirit. She's tasted that at least for short periods of time. So here you go. Somebody is already showing signs of a gift for prayer, and yet she doesn't make progress. She backslides. And so chapter five is about how the struggle with sin and overcoming sin in your life is very necessary if you're going to mature and make progress. To the degree that we're kind of reckless or inattentive about the way we let sin into our life, that's going to cause our our progress and our growth in the spiritual life to slow down. This is the gist, and she's, she's going to talk about good confessors and bad confessors and good relationships and and dangerous relationships. She starts, though, the chapter in talking about this witness of a sister who was filled with cancerous sores and and dies, and she is touched by uh, the fact that uh, these cancerous sores, which are on the outside of her body, Whereas the other sisters are kind of like repulsed, they find it really repugnant to to be in and around it. She's kind of attracted by the patience that she sees in this suffering sister of hers. And she actually asks for the grace to be able to have that same kind of patience. She asks for the Lord to bless her with a sickness that will allow her to be patient the way this other sister was patient. And right away, God begins to answer that prayer in this chapter. As she's in her novitiate, her time and formation gets interrupted, and she needs to take some time away from the convent to uh, be medically assessed. And it's during this time that she has her great struggles with sin. And I say this in all reverence 
to uh, the experience of St. Teresa, and for those out there, uh, be careful of what you ask for. Because to ask for a type of suffering to be able to increase a virtue, is that what I, I'm hearing her write in this particular entrance into Chapter 5? Yeah, I would say the Lord honors those kinds of prayers if it's good for our soul. And, and so he, he'll take us at our word, word. He'll take us seriously. And he, he seems to have done so with, with Teresa of Avila. She's also learning how to pray at this sta- stage of the game, too. She won't always be asking for illnesses as she goes on further. But God is going to give her ever greater patience as she m- begins to make progress. Uh, so in the, the beginning of the spiritual life, sometimes you'll hear of a young person, or you might even yourself, you know, uh, if only I, if I had that cross over there, I could be as patient as them or something to that effect. And God will honor that too, and, and sometimes allow you to uh, enter into the mystery of suffering and sickness. And he will use that. But that's more of a starting point than an end point. Sickness is something the Lord uses to an end for an important purpose. Once the purpose is accomplished, he is going to give you the health you need the, the service that he needs from you. And so what does this mean? Don't be afraid to enter into the world of intercessory prayer and petitionary prayer and to ask for great graces. And while you're right, Chris, we should be careful what we ask for. On, on the other hand, it delights the Father to give us good things. And so if we've asked for something that's not good for us, the Father's not going to give it to us. If a child asks for an egg, the father's never going to give them a scorpion. Jesus is teaching on this. And so so it is when we ask things of God. But also with petitionary prayer, you start out asking for things that maybe aren't the wisest things to, to ask for. Some people ask for sickness, and sometimes people also ask for material success. Both sickness and material success can get into the way of the spiritual progress that God wants you to have. And when it does, he's not going to grant those prayers. But when he sees an opportunity, he lets you see his sovereignty and he exercises his power and gives you the grace of either a sickness or or a material success or some other thing that you might ask for. That's the beginning of prayer. And as you learn how generous and good God is, you acquire a wisdom of heart to ask for the things that uh, are truly appropriate. And God blesses those prayers too. I know that in my life, Anthony, there have been times where I've had a suffering, physical suffering, that I didn't understand at the moment why this was happening or why the Father would allow it. But I got to a point where over time, realizing that the Father allows all things in his permissive will, and I know with certainty that he loves me, and that he wants nothing but my greater good, so that if he's allowed this, then I trust that. You kind of embrace that, and you end up offering it to whatever it is that he is trying to work in the soul at that moment. But that's tough. It's tough to get there, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is very difficult to get to that place. But that's part of, you might call it, the drama of prayer. Is it, it's a little bit like a dance with God. You have your will, and God has his will. He has his plan, and his plan is for you to thrive. And he begins as you engage in the art of prayer. He begins to cultivate in your heart desires for his honor and glory, desires for his his will to be accomplished that become stronger and stronger and stronger. Those desires would never grow and become strong if you didn't engage in prayer. And so prayer is an integral part of his plan for our growth and holiness, learning to ask for things rightly and learning to trust and learning to surrender and beginning to realize more and more just how wonderful God's plan is and how much better his plans are than our plans. And ultimately, as you engage in that art of prayer, there's a deep and profound surrender, a certain let it be done unto me according to thy word, 
that we're able to participate in. And when that happens, it makes space for God to do truly beautiful things in the world. I think that this is part of what we see with Teresa of Avila, that even though this particular chapter is largely about struggles with sin and foolishness that kind of go with being naive in the spiritual life, the other story that is being spoken here or implied is the story of a soul that wants to be generous with God and how God takes that soul from being a little bit turned in on itself and begins to forge in it desires for the glory of God that that goes so far beyond anything it could self-generate on its own. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. It's amazing in this beginnings of chapter five, where we hear that this is going to go on for at least three years for her. But at the start of it, she's at her sister's house. She's waiting. She is with the family she loves, but she's becoming very upset. And she recognizes that this is an activity of the enemy. And she wants to turn towards the sacraments, essentially, to go to confess her, to help her to deal with all this. And she ends up struggling and being challenged by those who may not be in a very good position to help her. What you're talking about are some of the the priest confessors that she went to at the time. And the priesthood is such an important gift for the spiritual life. And a good confessor is like pure gold, especially when somebody's new in their priesthood. uh, the, The wisdom of heart that uh, can be acquired after a lifetime uh, pursuing the Lord isn't like a magical thing bestowed on every priest at ordination. And you, you have to suffer that kind of wisdom, and, and it takes time. And, and so if somebody hasn't particularly applied themselves to the asceticism of, of sacred study, if, if they haven't been super diligent about their own spiritual life, uh, when they receive a soul and try to give it counsel, they're going to be impaired by the kind of the same spiritual diseases that they have in their heart. They're 
they're likely to pass it on to the people they're guiding them. This is one of the reasons why today this Eucharistic revival is so essential. Uh, we need to restore a kind of devotion to the Lord and his presence in the church that uh, leads us to a deeper conversion of life. This needs to happen for us, the laity, but it also needs to happen for priests and religious too. All of us need a deeper conversion these days. When that conversion happens, we're able to help each other grow in holiness with a great freedom and ease. And insofar as it hasn't happened, we sometimes put obstacles in each other's way. And this, this is exactly what she's experienced. In particular, uh, one of the confessors she was going to, she was trying to confess her sins, and sins that in her own conscience she believed were very, very serious. And when she confessed what she thought was a, a mortal sin, that the confessor would tell, would tell her it was only venial. It's not that big of a deal. And then when she confessed venial sins, that, that things that, that uh, she knew was wrong but didn't necessarily involve her full freedom or knowledge or, or didn't involve grave matter, uh, still, though, they were sins. When she confessed those, they, they would say they're not sins at all. And so what you have going on there, what she's describing, this is one of the great obstacles to growing into spiritual maturity, and that is a lack of sense of sin. The Eucharistic revival, restoring our devotion to the Eucharist, will also simultaneously help us develop a more healthy awareness of sin so that things that are really repugnant to God are also repugnant to us. And that's what's lacking in her life. She knows that God wants union with her. And God has given her these gifts of prayer that have allowed her to taste union. But she doesn't understand that there are things in her life that are really repugnant to God. From her perspective, because her conscience is relatively dull, she has a vague sense that they need to change, but she doesn't realize how serious they are. And a, a confessor who should be helping her glimpse how serious sin actually is, instead wants to make her feel good. And so what kind of man would abuse the sacrament to make somebody feel good about themselves? Well, someone who needs to feel good themselves because they also are not dealing with sin the way they're supposed to. And so this is what she confronted, and it became an obstacle to her spiritual growth instead of being able to kind of confront uh, very serious issues that were a threat not only to her growth in the spiritual life, but even threatened to kind of uh, cause her grave harm. She didn't have the serious awareness that you need to have if you're going to change your life. Another word for it that we have in our tradition is there was a lacking in her heart of that first step of wisdom that we call fear of the Lord. And here, probably it's important to make a distinction today because people hear fear of the Lord and, and they hear a sense of sin and they instantly think that what is meant is that God is this angry person sitting over judging us, holding us accountable for faults that we're only partly responsible for. So he's kind of a unjust tyrant who we fear because he's kind of whimsical and irrational in his anger and vindictiveness towards us. That's the way people think about God because it's it's often the way they've experienced somebody in authority in their life, either their own earthly fathers or someone else has been kind of a little tyrant with them. And so, so they, they projected that onto God. And this is a big block in our time. We don't have a sense of God as a loving father. And when you don't have a sense of God as your loving father, your propensity not to understand why sin is repugnant to him. So here's the reason why sin is so repugnant to God. God wants you to thrive. He's created you to live life to the full, to live a life that is meaningful and rich with great purpose. He's created you to, uh, to do something beautiful in the world that no one has ever done before and no one will ever be able to do again. And so the sacred purpose you have, it's going to cost you so much suffering. It's going to 
requires so much strength and industry and effort from you, and it's going to tax you beyond the limits of your strength, and it's going to bring you to a place where you're on your knees and discover how totally reliant on God you truly are. This is what we're made to do, because when we get into that humble place, this is when he does great things in us. Sins that we think are such little sins that we don't think are that important usually get in the way of that great movement. They cause us to think that that our purpose is much smaller than it actually is. And so that's why it's repugnant to God. The thing that we're clinging on to, the little sin that we're doing, the, the gossip that we don't think does any harm or the little compromise and in integrity here and the little indulgence there, those things that we think are so little are repugnant to God because they actually are against the very greatness and dignity that he yearns for us to know. And so they're repugnant to God, not because it harms him, but because it's harming us. And, uh, and he doesn't want you to hurt yourself. He doesn't want you to betray yourself or, or contradict yourself. He wants you to become who you really are. Well, Teresa of Avila, at this stage of her life, she doesn't have a vision of that. She doesn't have the vision of just how good God is and how precious this life is that we've been given and how the smallest thing can, can compromise the great work that God has given us to do. She doesn't have a, an awareness of that, and she, so she goes to the church to get help because she knows something's off, but she's not exactly sure what it is. And, you know, She knows that she's repeating sins that she really shouldn't be repeating, especially in light of the beautiful prayer that she's been given. She goes to a confessor to try to work this out, and the confessor, because he's kind of not very converted himself, doesn't have a very strong sense of sin, doesn't realize how beautiful and great the Father's goodness is and feels like the sacrament, the purpose of the sacrament is to make people feel good. So he gives her bad counsel concerning the very thing that she needs guidance on. So Teresa of Avila uses this reflection to talk about how important it is to find a good confessor who is learned and wise of heart, who not only has personal holiness himself, but actually has great pastoral prudence concerning the things of God and the things of God. And seek out a wise confessor who will really help you. If you go to confession to someone who doesn't give you good counsel, what do you do about that? Well, you pray for that priest, you pray for his conversion. But if your conscience is telling you that this isn't good counsel, it's likely not good counsel. Go find somebody with more wisdom of heart who can really help you. This is what she's saying. Otherwise, if you're confused on very fundamental things, you'll get trapped and you'll make catastrophic mistakes. And you, you, you'll you spend years wasting away when you could have made progress. This is something that I can relate to. And I'm sure so many people out there who are listening to you right now, Anthony, in that there are attempts to go, especially as you become more and more aware of what's happening with venial sins, just like you said, the gossiping, the detraction, the calumny, the jealousy, the envy, all those kinds of things that creep up in the course of every day, potentially, is a temptation, and we fall to it. And we will go to confession, and we're told that they're venial sins, they're not that important, or potentially, you might be accused of being too scrupulous. I suppose that's a reality in some cases, but these are also people who have heard how Mother Teresa would go to confession at least once a week, probably more. John Paul II, the great saint, would go to confession, if not daily, at least once a week. But then it would be pushed off. Well, they were they were saints. They were found. They needed to have that. You don't need that. These mixed messages that folks get, it's hard to travail that part of the road when you're dealing with, as you said, people who may not appreciate what the soul's attempting to accomplish. This is one of the things that the priests that the Lord sends in our lives, we have kind of an important obligation to pray for them and to fast for them and to work for their conversion too. Their job is to help us to convert, but it's not a one-way street. It's not them spinning themselves on us and then we don't do anything to encourage them 
just like their job isn't really there simply to make sure that we feel good about life and don't get too scrupulous. To the priest that you love, your job is the same to, for him too. We're, we're mutually implicated in each other's vocations, and this requires sometimes speaking tough truths that people need to hear in a loving and tender and patient way, but never, nevertheless, not being afraid to speak the truth, to you know, have that kind of hard exchange that good friends are supposed to have if they love God and they love each other. And so I, I empathize with people who've gotten bad counsel in confession. If we have confessors who are like that, well, what are we doing to build up the holiness of the presbyterate? The other thing you said that I, I think is important just to know is scrupulosity is, is a real problem. I, I've gotten to meet and, and talk to many souls that have this particular affliction. And it's a very difficult and painful cross. And for confessors who are dealing with people who are scrupulous, it requires extreme pastoral prudence. But here's the deal about scrupulosity. There is not a saint canonized in the church that I'm aware of who didn't pass through the school of scrupulosity at one time or another. It's a normal thing that a soul passes through as it grows in holiness. It's, it's like a season or a storm that needs to be suffered for a little while. And so if, if you are one of these souls suffering from scrupulosity, if the priest has told you you're suffering from scrupulosity, thank God, because it means the Lord is calling you to great holiness. And so you want to work with the confessor and you, you know, work with the plan uh, that, that he's laid out and you want to be obedient to it. But the way to help a scrupulous soul is not by telling them that venial sin is not real sin and that mortal sin is only venial. The way you help the soul to deal with that reality is help them distinguish between what sin is and what it is not and to trust God with what's not sin and to turn to God's mercy and to believe in God's mercy more than you believe in your sinfulness. That's kind of the basic task for a confessor when he has a scrupulous soul in, in his life. So how do we help priests gain that kind of wisdom of heart where they're so steeped in the mercy of the Father and the goodness of the Father's heart, they're able to lead even scrupulous souls into it so that in that mercy they're dealing with the reality of sin. Well, again, prayer and fasting uh, for a priest is absolutely essential. We'll continue this conversation in our next episode. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or on whatever platform you obtain your podcasts. There, too, you can also listen to an audio version of the complete autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.